morning. Is this thing on? I think so. Make sure. Get all situated here. Let's begin with a moment of prayer, if you would, please. Lord God, thank you. Thank you that we can be here. Thank you that we can sing to you, that we can commune together, and that we can declare our love for you and express our our appreciation for all you do. Guide us now, though, as we take a minute to, to talk and study together. Show us what you would have us to show us. Lead us through your spirit to a deeper understanding and a more meaningful relationship. Be with all of us that we can cast aside the things that are distracting us and that might take our, our, our thoughts off where we need to be right now. Bless us and be the, with us in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but there's many things in life that I take for granted of, and, and, and I, I want to point out your bulletin this week. I don't, know if you, uh, I don't know if you get yours like I do in, in the email, or you just walk in and you find it magically appearing on the chair where you're sitting. Um, it's it's kind of neat how that works. There's many things in life that, that are like that. We don't think about the process that's gone through that. Whether you realize it or not, um, throughout the week, um, Kim is being submitted song titles and sermon titles and information that goes there. She meticulously, and, and it's amazing when you stop and look at the process that goes through, whether it's a, the article that Devin's written this week or the, um, the different events, getting member, new member information, um, all, all these little details. Then she throws them all into this document, this digital document, picks out a beautiful picture, um, to put on there. Is that Grand Lake, Kim, this week? I don't even know where it is. But we always, and we, and we, we just take it for granted. We just pick it up and we look at it. And at six, about 6, 6, 6, 15 on Saturday morning, we get an email going, oh, you got a bulletin. Or you walk in here and you pick it up and you're going, oh, wow, I like that color. Or I didn't know that. But there's so many things in life that are simple, like a bulletin that we take for granted of, aren't there? Whether it's as simple as a bulletin or as complicated as your car. As we talk about the cross, and we're going to be looking at the cross, and if you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, um, it is such a simple thing, but yet it's so complicated. And for most of us, it's something that we have we've thought about, that we think about, that we that we deal with so much that I, I'm, I'm convinced that many times we, it just like it magically appears and we don't even think about it. And so when we talk about the cross today, I, I, I come and, and there's part of me that has to go, we need to go back and really remember how big of a deal the cross is, how important the cross is, because that is something that we, we take for granted of. And for some people, and especially in some cultures, the cross doesn't mean anything to them. And in fact, they don't understand that. And until we grasp, until we appreciate the cross, I don't think we can even begin to see the irony of it even. We've been looking at things that are ironic in our study here. Um, our picture, whether you look at it on the wall or I put it on the screen like this so that people that are watching online can see. This picture of the lion and the lamb. The irony of that, of this scroll that's being held in the book of revelation that can't be opened because it's sealed up tightly and what happens out comes this lion but it's not the lion that opens it it's this slain lamb that opens it um, you catch that irony but do you also hear the echoes of the cross in that too of jesus redeeming the world through not through or god redeeming the world not through this great lion but through this humble lamb we looked and we, we talked about, um, after that, we looked in our series of Joseph and his brothers and how Joseph became, in many ways, the savior of the world, didn't he? When his, he was sold into Egypt and he, and he saw the dreams of the Pharaoh and what happens? Build the barns and we save the world from this famine. And then he ends up saving not only his brothers, his, the world, but even his brothers who don't even recognize him who had betrayed him. Do you see the irony there? Do you see the echoes of the cross in there too? Edward took us on a journey as we looked at Paul in 2 Corinthians. And again, we saw the irony. Last week, we looked at Abraham and Isaac and, and this promised son who God asked the father to, to, to kill. And he was as good as dead as we talked about last week. And 
you really look at over and over again these stories of irony in the Bible, and, and, and so many of them, you can hear echoes. You can hear this constant murmuring of the cross through it, don't you? Till finally we get to this text here, and I want us to read, it, read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. And, and I want us to see this, if not the, if not the irony of the Bible, the, the, the biggest irony of all, I believe. The one that echoes throughout the whole Bible, constantly from Genesis to Revelation. We see the irony of the cross here. But the way he phrases this, and this text was, was, that's been selected for us, it, it shows us some things that I think are really, really neat about the cross and this whole irony, this whole contradiction that we've been dealing with. So let's read together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Where is a wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish things wisdom in the world of the world? For, si for since the wisdom of the world through the wisdom of through its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded signs and Greeks looked for wisdom, but he, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and the foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what we were when we were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were from noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that one may not may boast before him. It's because of him you are in Christ. We who has become for us wisdom of, from God, that is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, it's written that the one who boasts boasts in the Lord. You hear that echoing over and over again, that, that, that contrast there, this, the cross. Um, again, the cross has become a symbol of Christianity. The cross has become something that I think, it's, and in, in many ways it's not bad. When I say the cross, we think of a steeple or we think of something that someone wears around their neck. It's a symbol of Christianity, but what was it back in ancient times? It was an instrument of death. It was a hangman's noose. And when we really think of the story of Jesus, the Son of God, being convicted of a crime, falsely, and through a mock court, granted, but he was a convict who was killed. And has he and 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 killed in a very brutal way. And all of a sudden, when the world hears that we worship this Savior that was killed on the cross, the Son of God that was hung on the cross, to them they're going, that just doesn't make sense. My sister-in-law and my brother, they spent a, a year um, in a foreign country that did not know um, the, the, the Christian culture at all. The stories of the Bible were so foreign to them that they, it, it was, it was un, un, unfathomable for them. Just the name of Jesus to, in that culture was kind of, I think I know who that is, but they didn't know anything about him. And so as they were there teaching English, they, they got together with some friends they had met, and they sat down to celebrate Easter together. It was Easter season, and they sat down, and they were dying eggs and, and, and talking about things. And finally, they, uh, they said, the people asked him, so what's Easter all about? And my sister-in-law says, she said, without even thinking, she said, well, it's about the resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God, from the dead. And these people that had grown up in this culture that didn't know about Jesus, their response was literally to laugh out loud at them. 
it made no sense whatsoever to them. It truly was foolishness. And I say that because I think we don't understand the foolishness of the cross because it's something that we grow up with. It's, it's like the bulletin. It just magically appears and we, we go, oh, that's so cool. That's not... And unless you really stop and appreciate the cross, you really can't grasp the power of the cross either. And when you really start to think about how this is insane to some people, the thing that we just did with this communion, the fact that we just took his body and blood, historically has been something that rippled throughout time, causing problems for people. But yet we just take it for granted. And so in many ways, the irony of the cross is something I'm not sure we can grasp until we stop and go back and really think about what the cross means. But yet the, the key points I want to get here. The cross is lowly and powerful. When you really think about how lowly the cross is, until we really stop and really fathom that, and most of us, we've... We've taken communion day at weekend after week after week, and, 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 and it's a time when we're supposed to remember many times the cross is what we focus on in that, isn't it? But yet we don't grasp it. But I think we need to stop and realize how lowly but powerful the cross was. How even as you look back at the other ironies, the lion and the lamb, how, how that slain, defenseless lamb becomes the redemption, how the cross becomes this this brutal, cruel way of redeeming mankind, of allowing man to be in a relationship with God. It's very lowly. But as the text talks about, talked about over and over again, it is likewise very, very powerful. And we need to stop and really take some time to appreciate that. We need to understand that and grasp that. The second point I want you to, 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 to really remind us of is that God tends to prefer weakness. God likes to use weaknesses. The cross is such a weak and messed up thing, but yet what does he do? He uses that weakness to demonstrate his own power. God, over and over in the Bible, he'll take weak things to show how glorifying he is. It's, in many ways, if, if he used the powerful things, to sh then we would take the credit, wouldn't we? But it's when we're weak that God actually is seen. It's when it's through our, the, the difficulties that he comes out and he goes, wow, look how powerful that is. The cross is seen as this broken, messed up thing, and so what happens? God is glorified even more by the power of God that's through that. Now, let's, let's take a few minutes and apply this together. Number one, only when we appreciate the cross can we help people understand this great irony. Only when I really take time to appreciate the power of God and the wonders of this cross and really get more than just a symbol of my faith, that I can really actually share with people the great irony. N.T. Wright, as he's writing about this section, he talks about how, um, how the, this, is, this, is, this whole message is the gospel. This is the good news that we need to be sharing with people. But unfortunately, we're taking for granted the good news. We've forgotten how powerful and good it is. And so my invitation to you on this is to take some time this next week and really think about what the cross means. I think it's wonderful that we do it when we do it with the communion. But spend some time this week really thinking about how meaningful the cross is. Really, what does it entail? Maybe you need to read through the story of Jesus' betrayal, his death and resurrection in the Bible. Maybe you just need to go for a walk and talk to God and say, hey, I'm taking for granted you. I'm taking for granted the cross. And have that heart-to-heart -heart with God and really express your appreciation for what the cross means to you. Because until I really grasp that, until I do understand how powerful the cross is, I can't share that irony with everybody else. I can't share with them the good news. I can't... I can't celebrate it even in my own life, in my own heart. And so really spend some time appreciating the cross. The second one is trust God with your weaknesses. I want to hide my weaknesses, I got to, I, to be real honest. I want to deny my weakness. I don't have weaknesses. I'm not weak. 
We don't like to admit when we're going through struggles, but what happens is when we really do allow God to work through our struggles, when we allow him to work through our weaknesses like he did the cross, he redeems the world, he changes the world, he does amazing things, that's where the gospel really comes into play. That's where this good news of Jesus really transforms our lives. So for this application, where are you feeling weak? Where are you struggling? And give that over to God. Allow Him to transform that as He did the weakness of the cross and He made Jesus great. Allow Him to take your weakness, your struggles. A lot of us are feeling frustrated and stressed. We don't know what's happening in the future. That's a weakness we have in our culture right now, isn't it? But God will do great things through that if we trust Him. And the good news for us as Christians is we trust a powerful God who is mighty and He has shown Himself over and over again through this redemptive irony, through this irony that He keeps on taking care of us over and over again. We don't need to worry. that God's going to use that weakness to show His might. But we have to trust Him in it all. And so spend some time talking to God about your weaknesses. And asking him to help you to use that weakness for him. The story of the cross is one that is it is the cent, one of the center points of the Bible, if not the center point of the Bible. The irony of the cross is such a powerful one. And I think for most of us in here, at least in the culture we live in, it's one that we've taken for granted of. And I invite you to spend some time really thinking about that.